Thank you very much. And uh, just to say how absolutely delighted I am to be joining you um, virtually. And obviously, as distance learning lead, this is something I'm very used to. Um, I will stop sharing the screen at the end for some questions and answers, and then I'll be joining you for, for coffee as well later virtually. But uh, yeah, hugely, hugely thrilled to be sharing um, some of my passions through this talk. So I'm going to be talking about some of my own journey through academia, um, sense of belonging, why it's important for us as educators. And I'm going to then revisit some of my journey through the lens of sense of belonging and then how we facilitate sense of belonging. I will be sharing the toolkit, but it sounds like um, the majority, if not all of you, are ahead of me there. But I'll talk a little bit about its development. Um, and then Stella has, and, and uh, the team have very kindly shared with me the Heriot Watt framework. So then I'm going to look again at that through uh, the lens of sense of belonging. So without further ado, you've heard a little about me. I'm Professor of Medical Education, Associate Dean for Quality and Academic Standards, one of those rare people who actually finds this the most exciting bit of the job, this, the, uh, the quality assurance, when it go, moves into enhancement. Um, Deputy Director of the Centre for Medical Education, where we run a very large distance learning programme um, across uh, globally. And, uh, and that from that distance learning lead for the whole of the University of Dundee. But of course, that's, that's not the whole me. I'm also mum of three. Uh, my middle one is 30 today, so I'm feeling quite old. Um, a dog mum of two spaniels, um, member of the cathedral choir where I sing alto, uh, and a huge Luton Town football club. So I wear many hats, and uh, this one at the bottom is um, a boater, which is uh, the hat from a Luton Town supporter. I want to talk um, about something else about me. I have always loved board games, um, huge fan. And probably one of the first ones I would have played would have been Snakes and Ladders. And I've been learning the, uh, the British Sign Language uh, for, for Snake with the Forked Tongue and Ladder for Climbing Up. So that's been something I've learned today. I do like to learn something every day um, in my teaching. For those of you not familiar, you each have a counter, you move, you use the die, you move along until you get from one to 100. And you're competing to get to 100 first. So it's, it's a game of luck. So there I am, home and dry. If you come to a base of a ladder, because that's another thing about the board, it's not just one to 100, there are ladders on here, then you go up the ladder. Whereas if you land on the head of a snake, you go down the snake. And as I was writing the abstract for this talk about sense belonging, I wanted to draw on examples of enablers and barriers to my success from my own journey. And I was struck by the analogy that we could draw from snakes and ladders. The ladders are the enablers and the snakes, the barriers. And reflecting on those, shows me how I've overcome the snakes, learning from them, so I can climb the next ladder. And sharing some of those personal stories with my students has helped me, and it's helped them. It's also helped me shape the courses I teach on and those whose development I oversee. So let's explore together some of my snakes and ladders. My first ladder Looking back was the nurturing environment I started with, my family, my school, my friends. I didn't appreciate these at the time for how they contributed to a good start for me academically. Although I was the first to go to university straight from school, I had encouragement all the way through. And it was in those lucky, lucky days of a full grant from the government to support my studies, lucky me. And so I got into university, but oh, my first experience of university, big snake. I was homesick. I didn't understand the rules at all. I didn't understand the language. I couldn't see any alignment between what we had in our lectures and our assessments. The lectures were impersonal and required a lot of self-directed learning afterwards. This was not like my experience of school. I didn't feel I fitted in. And I felt I was the only one struggling. I wasn't. 
I see that now, but certainly the first half of my degree, I felt lost. And then I met, met my next ladder, my husband-to-be, who was from an academic family and was able to help me through. So here I am feeling rather alone at the bottom of my snake and feeling that everyone else is well ahead of me. So then I started to calm down. I learned how to study at the university. I learned, <laughs> this seems really crazy now, that there were past papers available and how to work with those past papers. I learned about asking my tutors for help, which, you know, thinking about it now, I'm thinking, well, of course, tutors were there for help. And I reflect on what were the barriers to me for asking for that help? I think I was scared. I, I was scared of them thinking that I was a failure because I didn't understand things. So reflecting on those has really helped me understand how the journey might be for some of my students. After working in London as a computer programmer, I went back to university at the tender age of 27 um, to do my teacher training. And there I met another snake. I failed my first essay. And I was mortified. I was embarrassed. I was, I went through all the stages of grief. I was furious, but then I was cross with myself. I felt I had really let everyone down. I had let the admissions tutor down because she had allowed me in on not the best degree in the world. She had faith in me and I had let her down. I'd let everyone down. I was mortified and I'd put so much hard work in. I still have the marked script in my office and now I can see exactly why it didn't pass. It was a social sciences essay. I did physics. It was too much my own thoughts. It didn't reference works and was, as my tutor wrote, journalese, as in something I might read in a newspaper. So it was well written, but it wasn't academic. But I felt a terrible sense of failure. I felt humiliated and I felt totally alone. But I had learned a little bit from my first experience of university and I did talk to the other members of the cohort. And guess what? It transpired all my cohort had failed that first essay. All the people on physics. We did not understand how to write for a social sciences subject. We were at least united in our failure. <laughs> so we had a sense of belonging there. And I'll revisit that experience later in this talk. And of course, you know, when we look at life, it's full of snakes. And it's full of ladders. And some of the ladders we as academics put in place and some of the ladders we help students put in themselves. And we think about learning. We think about putting in a scaffolding and then taking away that scaffolding as the students become more and more independent. We are helping them to learn the ladder, to create the ladders, maybe turn those snakes into ladders. Avoiding those snakes, learning from the snakes, learning from failure. I'm sure you'll have heard people say, if you're not failing, you're not pushing yourself hard enough. You're not working outside your comfort zone. Do we share that enough with students or we, do we just leave them to fail, to flounder and feel that they're only one? Sometimes we're on our own. Sometimes we are the only person who doesn't understand something, but more often than not, we're not on our own at all. And of course, that's for us as faculty as well. Do we share the struggles of our own teaching enough? Or do we think, oh, because, you know, teaching can be a very lonely, a lonely thing. We're on our own in front of a class. Do we share when things haven't quite worked out? Or do we again think, oh, I should be able to cope with this and not wanting to expose ourselves in our mind, feeling humiliated that something's not worked out. 
Of course, our goal, our square hundred, may look very different from person to person. And when we get there, that's often become square one of the next journey. So for my own journey, I think about my first degree, got there, square 100, but then I went into work, whoa, back to square one. And then into my teacher training, back to square one, but always using experiences from before to learn how to navigate through to the next 100. Do you remember passing your high school exams to go to university? From your degree to your first job, PhD to research fellow, starting as a lecturer. So now let's look at some of those key points through the lens of sense of belonging. You'll fit right in, something I didn't feel first time at university at all. You may be familiar with um, certainly the first definition. This is from Susie Peacock and John Cowan. Being accepted, valued, included and encouraged by others, teachers and peers in the academic classroom and of feeling ourselves to be an important part of the life and activity of the class. It's more than a perceived liking or warmth. It also involves support and respect for personal autonomy and for the student as an individual. And this one I've taken from the General Medical Council. The need to be connected to, cared for, and caring for others around us in the workplace, and to feel valued, respected, and supported. And I think we need to remember as faculty that we ourselves need to have that feeling, that sense of belonging to our workplace, and to feel valued, respected, and supported by our students, by our peers, by the university itself. And I, I think an event like this three day um, learning and teaching conference is a great way of feeling valued, of feeling respected, supported, and sharing those snakes and ladders. So a question we rightly ask about our research is the so what question. Well, here's why sense belonging is important to us as educators. An increased sense of belonging has been shown to increase identity formation, engagement, academic success, retention, and mental well being. Now, those are from the literature about students, also absolutely true about us as faculty. So, this, is, um, this was a, a project that the QAA very kindly funded that I co led with Susie Peacock, who was then at Queen Margaret University. And we worked with um, people from the Open University Scotland, the University of Highlands and Islands, and Napier University. And we, pro our proposal was to develop a toolkit to support development of self belonging, sense belonging in online distance learning courses, which I know many of you are now familiar with, which is fabulous. So it'd be really good to also at some point, maybe not now, but to get some of the feedback on how that's how that's impacting. So now I'm going to, we're, we're not, we're going to have some questions and answers at the end, but I'm just going to get you to think now of a group where you felt you belonged and think about how you would describe that feeling. What helped you to feel you belonged? And how did you know you belonged? Maybe there were ladders, maybe there were people who um, helped you along. For me, I felt I belonged in my early schooling. I felt not only cared for, I felt I was caring for others. I enjoyed learning. Now think of a group where you feel you don't belong or not so much. Now reflect on why, and I can see some comments coming up on the chat, which is great to see. Everyone's not playing the same board. Absolutely, Anne, totally agree with you. Some people have more snakes and fewer ladders. And I'm very, very aware of that first ladder, how many benefits that gave me in my early life that is most certainly not shared with a lot of the students. Um, looking at widening access, for example, looking at some of the chaotic lives, looking at part-time learners alongside jobs. So when you didn't belong, why? And if you tried to belong, but it didn't work, what went wrong? 
And whose fault if anyone was it? And for me, it was my first experience of undergraduate. Whose fault was it? Maybe the university could have done more on induction or transparency of alignment of teaching and assessment. I think so, but perhaps I could have taken more ownership earlier on. That was something I didn't really understand till well into my second year. So perhaps another factor for how lost I felt was that I didn't come from an academic family. I was the first to go to university from school, the only one of my generation. And I think also that put an enormous pressure on me to succeed. So I didn't want to tell people I was failing. Who could I tell I was struggling? And then lastly, think of a group where you've experienced a sense belonging that has been lessened at some point. So you started off with a sense belonging, but something happened. What caused that loss of sense belonging? What impact did it have on your behavior? So for me, I've told you about how I felt very ho at home doing my PGCE. I was settled at home. I'd made friends on the course. I thought I understood the assignment. It was a very different feeling to beginning my undergrad, but I failed my first essay and that made me lose my sense of belonging. I felt alone. But that time I did take a bit more ownership. I talked to the others and found we'd all failed. Now, one of my cohort withdrew from the course, which upset my tutor. And she asked if I could talk him round. Well, was that my responsibility? I didn't talk him round, he left, he felt humiliated. So this time round, the loss of sense belonging had had a very different impact on me. And interestingly, but maybe not surprisingly, those from non-scientific subjects overwhelmingly had passed. And this shows the importance of really understanding our results. Overall, perhaps the fail rate didn't look that high, but split by subject or by protected characteristics can tell a very different story and looking to where we need to put those extra supports in. So absolutely agree and about the different snakes, the different ladders that our different students are experiencing. So let's go, look, go back to good now definition, support, respect, autonomy, individually. I hadn't felt supported, but there was support there mutual support and respect. After that first fail of the essay, I didn't get anything less than a distinction from any essay after that. So you could argue for my learning, perhaps it was a very good experience. No, I don't think so. I think learning through humiliation, not good. And I've already told you about that one member of the cohort who left. For me though, it has had a very lasting impact. I can really think about the emotions that I went through. And now I teach on a master's in medical education. I'm teaching students from the health professions. And as for me and my fellow physicists, they may not have written a social sciences essay ever. They may not have written an essay for a long time. So for all our students, there is a formative assignment in their first module where they write the first part of the summative essay and get feedback on their academic writing their use of references and their criticality, all sadly lacking in my first attempt at my first essay. But maybe some of my social sciences colleagues feel that this isn't necessary with students. After all, they're all graduates. Are we spoon feeding? So I do find the whole concept of formative and what we put in there very interesting. And I do realize how much I have been shaped by that experience. Many of you will be familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and you can see belongingness highlighted here, a key part of our psychological needs. And then I was just thinking, well, what's the opposite? What's the opposite of sense of belonging? Brené Brown, the polar opposite of belonging is fitting in. Or is that the midpoint? Is alienation the polar opposite? Or is it more complex? So that's another thing just to be very aware of. Are we 
accidentally alienating some of our students by some of our behaviours, some of our language. So, sense of belonging recognised as a valued concept in education, key to academic success and persistence in face-to-face -face learning in higher education. <clears throat> At the heart of student retention and success is a strong sense of belonging in higher education for all students. What about online? Well, there's a dramatic increase. This was pre-COVID. There was a dramatic increase in the number of online programmes. Provides flexibility needed by professionals and those with familial commitments. Increase in attrition, recurring problem worldwide for online distance learning. Strategies which foster learning sense belonging could enhance online learners' educational experience and improve retention. Staff and students expressed greater satisfaction with online courses that successfully fostered sense belonging amongst students. But Garrison stresses the generic need of learners to belong and collaborate. Sense of belonging coupled with acceptance in a group with common interests. This sense of belonging and security facilitates open communication and creates group cohesion. Crucial that each student feels welcomed and is given the reassurance that they're part of a purposeful community of learners. And that stays with our students throughout their lives. For my own course, participants are able to apply learning day to day when they're doing their work part time alongside their profession. And they've noticed many impacts of doing their learning as a distance learner. Look at this last one. This was from one of my PhD students. Increased sense of belonging to the community of practice. So they were finding that within their workplace, they felt an increased sense of belonging to the community of medical educators worldwide. Extra challenges for distance learning, but still that importance, that importance of belongingness. So the same applies as for our face-to-face -face and our online identity formation, engagement, academic success, success student retention, mental well-being. So I'm now just going to share a few things of what we do on my own program, general considerations, beginning, middles, ends, alongside the uh, sense of belonging toolkit that we developed. Now, there are other things that are also important, admissions, induction, but that's out with today's keynote, but certainly things along the whole journey that we need to be considering as an institution. So I've already said about this project, who, who was involved, um, by institution. So it was uh, Heather Gibson, Amy McDermott, Susie Peacock, myself, Keith Smythe, and Linda Thompson. And then John Cowan was our critical friend. He's done a lot of work on sense belonging. We developed the toolkit for tutors, and here's um, the QR code for anyone who doesn't, uh, hasn't yet met it. Um, and it's uh, totally free, it's five hours of study, um, notionally. And um, because we, our partners, one of our partners was um, Open University Scotland, they very kindly hosted it as an open learn create. Then what happened? Oh my goodness, the pandemic. We all had to socially distance, we all needed to go online very quickly. This wasn't online distance learning, this was emergency remote pivoting with staff and students used to face-to-face -face needing to go online, often with suboptimal hardware and working conditions. As we now enter into the new normal, we've moved to a more blended approach. So many of the recommendations highlighted in our toolkit, originally for online distance learning, are relevant to our traditional face-to-face -face courses. After a lot of discussion, we decided our toolkit would have four layers and then assessment running through. So first layer, before the module starts, provide a carefully planned induction. Maybe commission a short video from learners further on. They're the ones who can highlight what they've really gained from that module. Maybe some of the snakes and ladders that they found useful for navigating their way successfully through that module. Close the evaluation loop from the last cohort. 
that student feedback back into the module, ensure institutional guidelines are inclusive of distance learners, but now we're thinking about blended learners as well as face-to-face, -face, and introduce the program team early on in including key su um, support staff. So we very much looked at uh, creating that safe environment for learners, but I'm really keen we also think about that safe environment for educators. Make sure our learners know how to, who to talk to if feeling lost, but also our educators, our professional services as well. Communication is key. Be wary of tone or lack of tone in written only communications. Though if you're anything like me, goodness, we learned how to use Teams, didn't we? <laughs> I had never used Teams before the pandemic. So within my own programme, we set up activities in smaller groups. So we might have 150, 200 students coming onto the first module, and then we split that into 20 student smaller groups for, discuss um, for smaller discussions. But then there's also an overall module discussion board. And we have lively discussions. We have live classroom groups. We have peer feedback groups. We try to time any synchronous activities for engagement, but we also record them and encourage people to post questions before and then have a little rounding up of Q&A after. Allow opportunities where possible for socializing and networking, just like you're having an online coffee after this. As you start the module, record that introductory video from yourselves, from the academic and the support. Have members of the class introduce themselves. Ask the students to share their hopes for the module and worries. Co-create guidance around use of discussion boards. Introduce a sense of place, whether that place is virtual or whether it is a physical place. So we have introduction boards for students. We do the video, we respond to the introduction boards, we share some tips from the last cohort. We, we talk about the changes made in response to student feedback and also the changes we haven't made and why, because we can't change everything. There may be some very good reasons that we can't change some of the things, but we want them to feel they're listened to. The ground rules for the module, we do encourage WhatsApp group. Now, this is this can be a bit contentious with some staff, um, and that is that there's no faculty involved. And I that does seem to be very popular with the students. And some of my colleagues worry that, well, if there's no faculty, if there's no professional services, they might be telling each other the wrong thing. But I see that very much as um, the virtual equivalent to the coffee shop. And I'm not going to go to the coffee shop and sit with the students just to make sure if they're chatting about the module, are they saying the wrong thing? So they need their own space. And sometimes we need to facilitate, we need to encourage them. Making sure all dates for the diary are very, very clear for them. Not knowing dates, missing an assignment because you've missed, you haven't noticed the date. Again, very alienating. Keep an eye on those who don't engage. So with the virtual learning environment, we can certainly tap into learning analytics and send out an encouraging email. We have a presence on the discussion boards, but we don't go in too soon. We want to encourage peer support. Remember one of the definitions I talked about also contributing to caring for others as well as being cared for. We encourage peer discussion. Ensure your language is supportive, not judgmental. Nudge learners towards constructive interactions and respond to student energy levels. Now, this is something I do find very difficult with a talk like this. I'm not with you in the room. I can't see how your energy levels are. I haven't used Menti in this talk. I thought about it, decided not to. So I am talking, you could have all fallen asleep for all I know. I hope not. And I can't read all the chat at the moment, unfortunately. So I can see some things pinging up there to say, nope, there's some people still awake. This is good. But it is very different for, oh, good. Someone's wide awake and very interesting. Excellent. You know, that sort of how we respond to students' energy levels. We check in regularly. We thank students for their contributions using their names. That is a big advantage of online. The names come up. <laughs> Keep things friendly. Mistakes happen is my colleague Mandy. You know, sharing mistakes. 
I've shared with you some of the snakes. My students find that very helpful. They tell me, seeing my journey, me sharing. Doesn't mean I have to share everything, of course. Keep it focused. Um, for assessment, we include a discussion board just for assessment discussion. We include formative. We think very carefully about that formative. We're very aware all the time of what might alienate. How do we keep that sense of belonging? Including peer feedback opportunities, space for reflection, supporting students required to submit. But we did look at our own assess whoops, assessment and feedback and the problems identified, that inconsistency in quality. I thought I had gone through and made sure there were no timings, but there is one here. Assessment design. I'm just going to have to keep flicking it back, I'm afraid. Timelines of feedback, lack of assessment and feedback dialogue and isolation of students and tutors. And here were a couple of um, responses when we brought in um, a feedback dialogue. I've been able to engage in more of a dialogue with whoever has graded it, the work, which has allowed a little more personality exchange and a little more support. When you feel there is someone at the other end actually looking at what you are working so hard at and treating you as a person. Now, this does, of course, conflict with the anonymization of marking. <coughs> Mark my work, not my face. So how do we respond to that? I just leave that hanging there and hear from a tutor. I also use it for closing the feedback loop. So if they tell me something's wrong with the module or anything in the module or the, or the course, or they don't understand it, then I'll also use that to say, thank you for highlight highlighting that. I've now changed it. So again, the students are feeling listened to. The tutor is feeling more involved. And this led to better feedback dialogue slow but no progression still not able to use social constructivist approach evaluation showed the students still felt isolated and the materials were hard to update when we were non-cohort so we moved then to cohort of our program and this really really improved things so thinking about when you design your program non-cohort i.e students being able to start or finish at any time may look very attractive to your students, but can actually be very impeding of developing that sense of belonging, making it difficult to update materials, making it difficult to have those lively discussion boards. So then when we decided we were going to move our program to totally cohorted with very set dates for start and finishing a module, the progression really, really improved. The isolation for tutors as well as the students dropped dramatically. So think about when you're designing right at the beginning. But what about the end of the module? Revisit the hopes and fears of the students. Explore their student tutor thoughts on benefits of module to future work. Encourage completion of evaluation, that student feedback. But think, am I going to do that single or group? Menti is great for doing evaluations, student evaluations, and then just discussing it with the students, maybe dig into it a bit deeper. Closing that evaluation loop and then asking students to post tips for the next cohort. So remember how that's how we recommended starting at the beginning. Tips from those students looking back. And that really, again, seems to encourage that sense of belonging to the whole programme. So we do acknowledge their hard work, evaluations, top tips, and wish them well for future modules. And now I just want you to reflect a bit on how this fits with your own framework, the global change maker attributes. Dimension one, learning for sustainable development. Do your students understand enough about key sustainability issues? Do we assume too much of, do they share do they share, you know, we might have a very clear definition in our own mind of what the key points are. But listening to the students, helping them take ownership. Recommends multidisciplinary teams. Is that a time to further develop sense of belonging and sense of belonging to what? Is there a good time to do this? What are the pros and cons of early in the curriculum? 
or later in the curriculum? Do we want that multidisciplinary team right at the start or actually do we want them to get used to their own team first? There are no right or wrong answers to these. These are just things for you to develop, to think about in your own context. Assessment for learning. How might you consider sense belonging and alienation in your assessment strategy? How do you support your students? How do you support each other? Reflect on your own experience. What helped and what hindered? Maybe visualizing assignments and the timings. So this is from Russell and Bygate, the formative, medium and high stake assessments, planning along for here for a student taking four modules. But also maybe start to think putting in professional services pressure points, academic pressure points. Dimension three, discovery and co-creation. How do you currently involve students in design of your courses and programs? Current students, further on students, alumni? How do others? How might co-creation encourage sense of belonging? What might cause alienation? Dimension four, research industry and community collaboration. How do you currently involve employers in the design of your courses and programs and alumni? How is sense of belonging supported in your research collaborations within and beyond the university? How might these encourage sense of belonging? Current students, alumni, yes. Faculty, professional services, as well as academics, industry. Again, what might cause alienation? Dimension five, inclusive global learning community. How are you supporting a global community? How is that sense of belonging fostered? How is equity embedded? And how do you know if what you're doing is inclusive for the different protected characteristics? Is there anything you're doing that is alienating? And how do you know? And lastly, dimension six, resilience, well-being and compassion. How important to you is sense of belonging? How does it relate to resilience, well-being and compassion? How do students support each other? How do faculty support each other? So I'm going to finish now with uh, just talking a little bit about why I use storytelling so much in my teaching. It's key to learning through reflective practice. Educators have always used storytelling as a sense of sharing information and helping learners to make sense of issues. Many different formats of stories, all sense making, engages learners, shares knowledge, and leads to meaningful links between theory and practice. Autobiography, autoethnography, however we call it, that like using our own stories, sharing what we want to share. I'm not saying you should share everything with the students, sharing with other faculty. Think about what worked for you in your own academic journey. What has worked for you that you might now take going forwards in your own teaching? What's working for others that you might do going forwards? So I've covered some of my own journey through academia, sense of belonging, why it's important for us as educated. I've revisited some of my journey, how we can facilitate sense of belonging, shared the toolkit and shown you some of the ways we've applied it to our own course, links to the framework. Thank you so much for sharing it. It's always lovely to see other people's frameworks. Some of the references of the work that I've talked about. And now it's over to you. Over to you to consider the benefits and challenges of developing a sense of belonging in your students and helping your students develop that sense of belonging. It doesn't all fall on us. We are facilitating. Reflect on aspects of your normal approach and what you need to consider as your potential new normal going forward. Reflect on the gaps in your current approach and identify ways to address these. 
and consider how you might use autobiography to instill sense of belonging.